So I was over, I was way over. Not, not really way over. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Heather, yeah, you're up next. Why don't you start closing the Yeah, so message. our, our next speaker is going to talk about forestry and a day in the woods and best management practices. Uh, Heather Brazel is our um, friend and former board member. Uh, but when she got the forestry center really going, she said, oh, y'all are going to have to be on your own for a while. Um, so. Oh, okay. Heather manages um, hundreds of acres of pretty awesome river from property. Heather, thank you. And um, when I was asked to speak tonight, I thought I was on the five minute list, not the 15 minutes. <laughs> and I've been busy all day, so I haven't prepared anything. I'm going to be uh, just talking off the top of my head here. Um, I, I wear a number of hats and that come to bear on this topic. Um, I started out in, as a forest ecologist in Australia looking at nutrient cycling and particularly looking at uh, losses of nitrogen when you burn after you clear cut. And then I've been teaching science and got, have um, recently become very involved in environmental education. And um, I'm also a student, a forestry student at ABAC. Um, so I'm wearing different hats. Um, I got really in, interested in a more leadership role in environmental education uh, when my husband was doing estate planning and he put out the property into a permanent conservation easement. It's on the Alapaha River, which is one of the reasons why I'm so um, supportive of the Walls Group and, and um, the water, water trail and everything that they're doing there. Um, so we put the property into a conservation easement, and conservation, I think we've got to protect places that are natural, or in, you know, of course in South Georgia that means they haven't been logged for about 40 or 50 years, so they're hardly um, original and understood. But we've got to conserve places that are allowed to grow naturally. We've got to conserve them for their, our habitat, our mental and physical health, I think, uh, and many other things depend on it. So having conserved it, my husband and I were talking, and said, he said he had always been a scientist, and he said, I really would like to develop a nature centre. I thought, oh, how on earth can we do that? So um, in the last few years, what I started out by doing is making the property available for environmental education uh, groups to use the property as a resource to use for outdoor labs, for workshops, field trips, field days, um, things like that. Um, and I, so I sort of have grown into this. I was out with a couple of really formative experiences. I was out with them, some little kids from the community. And I'd been working with them in their summer after school tutoring and their summer program, taking them for nature walks and things like that. And these little kids from rural Alapaha, I started eating blackberries. Don't eat that, you'll die! And I thought, that is so tragic. These kids didn't even know you could eat blackberries. We've got to do a better job of putting them in touch with their environment. Then I went on a, a teacher conservation workshop organized uh, through Georgia Forestry Association Foundation. And um, it takes teachers for a week and um, it's sponsored by a lot of the forest industry groups. And these teachers, by signing up, they're self-selected as environmental educators. So we're not talking about across-the-board teachers. We're talking about self-selected environmental educators. Those teachers were teaching their kids, you shouldn't cut trees, 
you shouldn't burn, you shouldn't use herbicides even on invasive species, you shouldn't do any of these things. Forestry is Georgia's second most um, um, income producing industry. A lot of our people work in the industry. And these kids are growing up, going home, telling their forester dads, oh, you're wicked, you're cutting trees down. I was listening to um, Diane Reem, what's her show? Um, really good uh, talk show that she does on, in the mornings. Really high quality. And she was talking about making paper and got into a discussion with a guest speaker about why aren't we using uh, linens and, and uh, cotton and other things? Why are we cutting down our trees to use in paper? There is a total lack of understanding that trees are simply a long rotation crop. They're, re they're sustainable. Every time you cut trees, if you're on a sustainable tree farm or, or similar situation, unless you're converting to other uses, you replant those trees and you get another crop. So there's a, I was really frustrated with the total lack of understanding out there in the general community in terms of what forestry is all about and what we do. I'm also frustrated when I talk to people about um, what foresters do. There's this perception that they're out there to cut down every last tree they can get and make every last money and go into those wet places and get every one of those old growths out. So I can talk to you from my experience as a forestry student. The focus, and I can only talk from the ABAC program, which is excellent, but the focus is on good stewardship. It's not about getting the last bit of lumber and getting the last tree out of the woods. It's about protecting your water, which is an incredibly important resource. It's about protecting our diversity of our species. It's about providing good habitat for our wildlife. It's not just about plant a tree, fertilize it and get it to grow as quick as it can and then cut it down and take it to the mill. So there's, I'm, seeing a lot, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of misunderstandings about the entire forestry industry, from the teachers, to the conservationists, to the general public, not understanding what our number two industry in Georgia is all about. <coughs> so that's sort of part of the, the background of why I'm so um, committed in, in environmental education. I'm involved with Project Learning Tree, teaching teachers. I'm involved with programs working with children I'm involved with um, advanced um, training of environmental educators, which includes both um, K-12 teachers and informal educators as well. So that's a little bit of the background to, to get you there. My, our property is, um, talking about um, the, the rivers and the protection, is about 50% hardwoods, all the drains and the bottoms that are protecting the Alapaha River and about 50% that's more upland was once upon a time um, uh, agricultural land and has been converted back to planted uh, forests. There's a perception out there that uh, planted trees are a monoculture. No, they're not. If you get um, the um, longleaf wire grass ecosystem and you keep it with its um, fire, uh, prescribed fires at regular intervals, the understory is one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems that we have, other than your um, tropical reefs and uh, tropical rainforests. And so um, plantations, there's another way of thinking about planting trees, and that is that um, like with our, um, our um, national parks and state parks, they try to concentrate all the people walking around and doing things on a very small area so that the rest of it gets conserved in a more natural and unimpacted state. The more we
we can concentrate our productive use of, of um, growing trees. Is anybody going to do without the toilet paper? We're going to need trees. And the more we can make our planted um, stands productive, the more it takes pressure off the, the other um, forested areas. So in fact, we really want to be more efficient in our planted stands so that we can be very good stewards of the rest of the stands. Um, another one that comes up is in terms of pine straw. People see it and it is so ugly. They've herbicided, it is bare underneath, it is a monoculture, and there is no biological diversity there. But think about it. Where are those stands for the pine straw? They're in old field situations. What was on the ground? A hair, centipede, all those egg weeds that we want to get rid of because we don't want them in our forests. So when I herbicide under my trees for pine straw, I'm not destroying native plants, I'm destroying egg weeds. And I harvest only until the first thinning, which is about age 15, 17, something like that. Once you've done your thinning, there's so many branches on the ground that it's uneconomic to do pine straw. So I've got rid of all of those egg weeds, and now I can come in and do understory restoration. And I can bring in some of the grasses, and I can burn regularly, and I can get my really nice mature stands and build up the seed bank that's going to continue for the next generation. You can incidentally do pine straw by lifting the pine straw off grasses without herbiciding if you've got um, a grass understory that's worth protecting. But by here in centipede, I've got no hesitation about, about getting the spray out on those. Um, so, I, I, <laughs> that's a long-winded way. So I started out making the property available for um, environmental education programs. And um, my husband, for whatever reason, I, I, I have absolutely no idea, but he, we had a big tobacco barn and he wanted a toilet put in there. And I said, well, if we're going to put one toilet, we might as well put two. Because if we're going to get people out here for field trips, we really need to give them some facilities. So it kind of grew like that, a little bit more and a little bit more. So what I have out there now is I've got a big um, tobacco barn that I've insulated and air-conditioned, and it's useful for meetings and lunches when the season's hot. And um, there's a lot of area on the river with bottomlands and cypress uh, swamps and flatwoods and uplands and a wide variety of habitats. And um, Don's been out there doing with his um, ground penetrating radar, looking at an old black cemetery and some of the geo. I've had geology lab as well. Uh, BSU has been out looking at fish in the river. ABAC uses the property extensively for measurement labs, for fire ecology. They were out there, in fact, today? No, yesterday. And um, amphibian, bird counts, you name it. They do and, uh, projects and research and so on. So the, uh, I've had middle grades um, students doing campouts and Cub Scouts doing fishing. So I, I just make, that, make it available for, for when people come. So, spring, every year, this is the third year we're organising it, we have a big community event called, which we call the Day in the Woods. And it comes from that kind of history and also from the number of parents who say to me when I, I say, take your kids outdoors, take them to the woods, take them on the river. And they say, oh no, it costs. It costs to go to a state park. It costs too much in gasoline. It costs because the kids want ice creams and everything when I go there. So we do this day in the woods. It's totally non-commercial. No entry fees, no vendors. Kids aren't pestering mum with, hey, I want an ice cream, I want a candy box. It's amazing what that does to the attention and persistence of the children. I did an, an activity making um, our baskets out of uh, long-leaf pine needles. I had little kids staying with me for 20, 30 minutes. When we hear what's going on in the schools, we don't think that's possible. 
It is if we get them interested and get them away from something that they can spend money on. So what we do is we just have lots of different people out there and the activities, um, it's focused on activities and demonstrations and sharing the wealth of, of local artisans and people who know stuff and can do stuff. And I don't think we do enough of that celebrating our people wealth either. And so we do activities that are related to forestry, wildlife and crafts using natural materials, focusing on some of the local traditions. This year, thanks to Dave and also to um, Mark Dixon, we've got Agrarama on board and they're coming with six different activities. So I'm absolutely thrilled with that. So let me uh, read some of the kinds of activities that we do. These are just some of the ones and there are multiple versions of it. Archery, fishing, wildlife calls, go for tortoise camera down a burrow, animal footprints, taxidermy, pine cone bird feeder, native bee nest, bird migration, identifying trees, native plants, measuring trees, leaf prints, fire behavior, and GC comes in and does a fire. And the last two years we've had a portable sawmill, but he's um, not able to do it uh, too much work and effort. Soils, drones, making paper, turpentine history, bark baskets, pine needle baskets, vine baskets, wood turning, history, wood wall carding, spinning and dyeing, fixing old buildings, rosin potatoes, blacksmith, cross cut saw. When? Earth Day, April 22nd. Starts in the afternoon at one o'clock and then we go on with a bring your own cookout and a nature walk and an astronomy evening by the Valdosta States um, what do they call it? Astronomical Society. Um, Martha Leake is uh, going to do, they've done a program with um, kids before out there, and she is just wonderful with the uh, with people of all ages. They just learn so much. So I'm up, I have all kinds of activities ready to go if, if uh, people want to uh, present an activity, or if you've got your own. Things about the water, I'm still trying to get insects, I'm trying to get macroinvertebrates, um, from the water, um, just anything, anything that you love and are passionate about and want to share with other people who need to learn what fun it is to be outdoors and to love the outdoors. I was also driven by a quote from Abu Doom or something, Ethiopian ecologist. We love, no, we, we protect only what we love. We love only what we understand. We understand only what we're taught. And I think we all owe a lot to, we know these things, to share them with other people. I really feel a mission to share my property with other people who can learn to love it. So often the kids will say, oh, but that belongs to people. I can't go there. That's, that's uh, poaching, that's trespass. I think if we want to keep our property, and if we want voters who are going to vote cost chair subsidies so that we can be good stewards of our land. We've got to help them feel that connection with the land and feel some ownership and feel some love and feel the importance of, of, of um, being good stewards. So I guess that's, I probably did use more than five minutes. <laughs> So how do we get to your place? Oh, it's um, 40 miles north of Valdosta. It's um, in the Lampaha, 20, which is 20 miles east of Tifton. And it's um, three miles and I, um, there is a, a website which was never done properly in the first place and I need to fix it and all the rest. Um, but there are directions on the website. Um, but uh, uh, if you Google on the address, and I do have little half page things to remind you so I can hand those out. So you can GPS on the address. Okay. Okay? So please share the information with friends, colleagues, children. Um, there are so many people. Do you know of anybody uh, that's other done something similar to what you're doing in, in Georgia? I don't know anybody. Maybe up on the Etowah, uh, the Watch here. So, but I mean, how did you come up with the idea of using a conservation easement? Because I, anyway, I just want to, it's, it's, it's not very much common for people to do that here, right? It's unique. 
Yeah, I know. I don't know. I'm just, the great we probably need, I mean, that would be great if we could get more of these things. Yeah. You know. well, we need to use what we have. Just Everybody that I know of is a 501c3 or an mm -hmm. outreach yeah. from a university. Yeah. There is a forest education center that uh, Gail Westcott does up, um, up near UGA. Um, but I don't know anybody who just yeah, do. does it. And, and yet, when I think, what I've done presentations for teachers. One of the things I recommend to them is if you want to get access for field trips to, to land in your region, is to go and find out who are those conservation easement people because they've shown a commitment to the land and they probably would be, uh, think that it's special and would be willing to share that. Well, I guess there was one down in Florida that the Sable Trail is going through the middle of, right? That was a big, huge wetland preserve that some, some famous environmentalists set aside. And how about a test in the How does this, uh, how did they end up picking that? I mean, did they, do you think they're targeting those, knowing that there's less, I don't know, just, anyway. I hope, I hope it's a good, a good thing to be setting this land aside. They the wanted to get to Crystal River, and so, that was a close way to get close to where it crawls together with the future river to get there. But it's kind of far afield from her. Yeah. Point. 